Good afternoon. On behalf of the board and staff at IMFG, I'm delighted to welcome you to our virtual event this afternoon on local implications of a national housing strategy, the case of Toronto. My name is Enid Slack and I'm the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. While I am at the University of Toronto, I know uh, people are here from all over the place, all over Toronto and Canada and other parts of the world. Um, but I would like to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I would like to start by thanking the external funders of the Institute, Havana Capital, Maytree, the City of Toronto, the Region of Halton, and the Region of York. And I would like to especially thank Julie DiLorenzo of Diamante Development Corporation for funding the Blanche and Sandy Van Ginkle Fellowship. I'd like to thank our team, uh, at IMFG, who uh, made today's event happen. Uh, Nevena Dragicevic, who was acting as our uh, interim program manager uh, while Thomas Hatchard was away. So I'd like to thank Nevena, who's gone back to Maitri, and Thomas Hatchard, who's back with us again, and Piali Roy, our administrator. I'd also like to thank the events and technical staff at the Monk School, uh, Daria Dumbadzi and Adam Bell. If you are tweeting about this event, our hashtag is IMFG Talks and our Twitter handle is at IMFG Toronto. One of our goals at IMFG is to support graduate students to work on topics in municipal finance and governance through two fellowship programs. Today, we're going to hear from James Ankers, who is this year's Blanche and Sandy Van Ginkle Graduate Fellow in Municipal Finance and Governance. James is a PhD student at the University of Toronto in the Department of Political Science. His research focuses on governance of the local welfare state in, particularly, in particular as it relates to housing. We all know the housing challenges faced by Toronto. They are enormous. There are more than 80,000 households on the city's subsidized housing wait list. Another almost 8,000 people experience street level homelessness on any given night. At the same time, the average price of a home in the city has surpassed the $1 million mark, making Toronto one of the least affordable places to buy a house in Canada and indeed internationally. The city can't solve these challenges on its own. With the introduction of the National Housing Strategy in 2019, Toronto and other cities around the country have found a newly re-engaged federal partner to help tackle housing affordability and homelessness. The National Housing Strategy also represents an important shift in intergovernmental relations in Canada, with the federal government directly engaging and funding municipalities. This afternoon, James will explore the implications of this shift, how it differs from business as usual, and how new policy tools and approaches under the National Housing Strategy are empowering local communities. So James is going to talk for about 30 minutes, uh, then there'll be time for me to have a little uh, moderated discussion with him, and then at the end we'll have time uh, for the audience to ask questions. So on Zoom, you know the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen is where you can ask questions, you can ask them at any time, I will monitor them, and at the end of the presentation and discussion, I will pose as many of your questions as I can to James. So now, James, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Enid. Let me just take a second here to get all the technology up and running. That looks great. That looks great. So hello, everyone. Thanks, Enid, for the very exciting introduction. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the local implications of a national housing strategy. But before we get to that, a few thank yous, I think, are in order first. Echoing Enid. Uh, first of all, I want to first thank Julie DiLorenzo and the Diamante Development Corporation for their support of this fellowship. I also want to thank Dr. Slack and the whole crew at IMFG, particularly Nevena, Thomas, and Piali, for some extremely patient support in the development of this project.
So today we're going to be talking about what the new federal approach to housing policy means for municipalities like Toronto. We're going to break that up into four sections. First, we'll talk about what the national housing strategy is, and particularly what the unique features of its design are and how these locally scaled partner centric new programs differ substantively from past federal approaches to housing policy. Then second, we'll talk about how to interpret and how to think about this new federal approach to housing policy using a central organizing idea of the federal government as a meta governor. Here we can think about meta governance as the shift by senior governments away from delivering traditional services to working to direct indirectly empower, and more importantly, coordinate the work of other governments and of local actors. The shift by the federal government from government to meta governance is at the heart of the significance of the national housing strategy that I wanna talk about today. Thirdly, we'll talk about what the implications of this meta governance shift for Toronto are. In brief, the national housing strategy offers distinct new tools and resources for cities who want them, but accordingly, requires active, deliberate planning, local leadership, and a careful social strategy to use these tools both effectively and fairly. And so given this, I'll conclude today by offering a few suggestions about where to go for Toronto and for other municipalities, and how these places can best position themselves to not just succeed, but thrive in the new intergovernmental landscape of housing policy in Canada. It's useful, before we do anything else, I think, to distinguish the approach to the NHS from some previous federal engagements in Toronto's housing afford affordable housing system. I'm sure we all recognize here the St. Lawrence redevelopment, internationally recognized, even Jane Jacobs approved, an example, the sort of enormous tri-level project that we typically think about the federal government being involved in, doing not just affordable, but large scale housing development. These sorts of vast intergovernmentally negotiated redevelopments are, however, relatively rare in the grand scheme of things. And these sorts of plans tend to also be slowly developed, politically contentious, and as the pictured sidewalk labs proposal here reminds us, not immune to failure sometimes. This is how we've long approached the federal role in urban affordable housing development. Land clearance, massive projects, and mixed successes. National housing strategy works on a very different scale. Its biggest and its most visible projects so far have come in parking lots, like this one in East York, where a new rapid housing project is being developed, or this project, where existing co-op housing is being refurbished. Rather than working at a grand scale, the NHS ultimately operates through bespoke local level partnerships. This is the direction the federal government has, I think, unambiguously indicated that it prefers to work. A move away from mega projects and towards the street level and the small scale. So what actually is the national housing strategy? In brief, it's both a reorganization and an expansion of the existing federal role in supporting affordable housing in Canada. A particular note for us is its design as what CMH refers to as a toolkit approach. Rather than a single program, the NHS consists of over a dozen distinct initiatives, each with its own goals, its own funding amounts, and funding criteria. The largest of these, for instance, the National Housing Co-Investment Fund, commits both loans and grants to a wide range of eligible building and rehabilitation programs, while smaller programs, like the Community-Based Tenant Initiative, work directly to build and engage local housing groups and networks. Characterizing the NHS is therefore actually a bit of a challenge, but I think that if we look at how these programs operate, both in where the funds are being targeted and in the mechanisms being used to deliver services, a significant organizing structure will come into view, characterized in part by the winding down of previous focuses and in part by the introdu introduction of several new program areas. Looking at first where funds are targeted, NHS spending can be broken down into roughly three buckets. The first of these is traditional intergovernmental spending, where Ottawa enters into bilateral agreements with provinces and territories and offers semi-targeted funds 
to be used for provincialized affordable housing services and new rent supplements. In the 2017 agreement, significantly, these amounts fell by 12%, 12% despite a new $2 billion for rent supplement programs. The second of these is homelessness funding, where Ottawa works through the Reaching Home and Rapid Housing Initiative programs directly with municipal level partners in order to provide shelter and housing services. Spending in this area went up dramatically in 2017, rising by 62%, and has actually risen further since with a new cumulative $2.5 billion rapid housing initiative. The final of these, and I think the most significant for our purposes, is a series of brand new programs targeted at building new housing stock and rehabilitating existing affordable housing. These programs cover a wide range of affordable housing projects and needs, and some even offer funds for possible market rate rental housing projects with, it should be said, accompanying affordable housing units. This kind of direct engagement in overall stock building, and particularly in the rental market, marks a significant new direction for Ottawa's role in housing policy. One way to think about these changes is that the federal government has cut its role in intergovernmental agreements that have long characterized federal affordable housing approaches, and in turn, dramatically increased its own provincially independent role in both homelessness and affordable housing development. There's a significant pivot, in other words, away from provincial partnership and toward a new form of federal leadership. Just as significant as the new leadership role is what exactly the NHS has chosen to do with it. In terms of program design, the most significant feature here is that in no single program or area does the federal government ever work alone. Every single NHS program requires some sort of partner or applicant. In several programs, including the flagship National Housing Co-Investment Fund, the federal government goes so far as to actually require applicants to identify co-funding governments before approving any applications. We can think about this then as a shift from government-directed to community-led policymaking. Rather than providing services directly, National Housing Strategy consistently has Ottawa supporting those already active in the field, using its spending power to either directly select partners or indirectly seek applicants, and in either case, enable their work through either one-time investments in the form of grants, or more often in the form of low interest loans and mortgages. This shift away from engaging the provinces and towards engaging and supporting existing housing and homelessness networks, I think is a deliberate approach by the federal government, which through the NHS is consciously using more importantly, consciously trying to steer the resources and efforts of community partners and of other governments, and in doing so, tapping their financial, organizational, and developmental resources as it pursues its own goals at the same time. SHIFT also has an according scalar dimension. Rather than supporting provincial level policy, or even pr pursuing a nationalized standard, the NHS is inviting local level partners and selects projects with their input. This means that federal housing policy is now deeply characterized by an unmistakable place-based approach, using local partners to match projects to local demands and needs. So with all this in mind, how should we think then about this new partner-focused community level approach to federal housing policy? As I said earlier, and borrowing from some 2014 work by Neil Bradford, I think we should think of this as an example of the federal government choosing to meta-govern. By recognizing that there's actually dozens of engaged, capable partners available between not-for-profit groups, private developers, and other levels of government, the federal government has chosen to support and implicitly direct these existing groups and actors, rather than complementing their work with its own national level interventions. So if we think of meta governance as an effort by senior governments to indirectly manage and support these complex networks already trying to solve pro policy problems, rather than trying to solve these problems directly, I think the federal government's goals and approaches here really snap into focus, as do their significance for municipalities. Federal government and the NHS 
has chosen to use its policy authority and its significant financial resources to just engage partners and support their efforts cooperatively in co-delivery models. So let's take a second and look at what this meta-governance co-delivery approach looks like in action. First, we can look at the Reaching Home program. Despite having gone through several name changes over the years, Reaching Home has actually been the federal answer to homelessness for decades. Here, the federal government identifies viable local partners and tasks them with receiving and distributing federal homelessness funds while still reporting regularly back on progress. In Toronto and in many other municipalities, the city itself serves as this community entity. At the same time, the federal government selects a local advisory board to oversee the community entity's work. From the federal government's perspective, this has two advantages. First, it reduces the overall bureaucratic workload federally. And more importantly, it necessitates and demands some level of local group coordination and communication. This is the real purpose, I think, of the Reaching Home program design. By engaging locally at multiple points, the federal government hopes to not only leverage the resources of a single local partner, but to encourage the harmonization and coordination of as many available local partners as possible in order to maximize the impact of the initial federal investment. As the oldest tool in the strategy's self-described toolkit, I suggest that this logic of coordination and leveraging through local investment has now come to characterize every new part of the NHS. In Toronto, this logic, it seems, has paid dividends. The city serves as the community entity while a group of homelessness facing not-for-profits and service providers, collectively known as the Toronto Alliance to End Homelessness, serve as the community advisory board. Once, I think distinctly frosty, relationships between the city as a service provider and the community as a service provider have actually been institutionalized now through these requirements of the Reaching Home program. The resulting group, the Toronto Housing and Homelessness Service Planning Forum, is co-chaired between the city and the Alliance and meets regularly to consult and to steer and coordinate policy approaches. And this, I suggest, is an example of the federal meta-governance approach working exactly as intended, where recurring federal investment has led to improved local cooperation, coordination, and service delivery. From here, we can now, I now look at the NHS's various stock building and stock rehabilitating programs, all new. Rather than select a single local partner to manage a pot of funds, as in the case of homelessness, the federal government has thrown applications here open to everybody countrywide. Perhaps and likely, this is due to the significantly larger scale of these programs and the significantly higher costs involved in housing development and rehabilitation, necessitating a broader range of partners and more flexibility in their selection. All programs in this vein require applicants to demonstrate financial stability by requiring significant existing financial commitments and frequently further commitments by other levels of government. They also reward applications that go above and beyond minimum federal standards for affordability so as to encourage some level of competition in the ambitiousness of applications. So here the federal government is able to maximize its use of local resources flexibly while getting individual projects underway relatively quickly with little to no time consuming, maybe more importantly, controversial intergovernmental negotiation. Unlike in homelessness, once these projects are underway, the federal role proceeds quite quickly and is generally con confined to the mortgage capacities of the CMHC. These programs, and especially the National Housing Co-Investment Fund, have been expanded significantly since 2017 due to heavy interest and honestly seem likely to be expanded again in the future. So the federal role in this area is less that of a civic enabler, as in reaching home, and is more that of a not-for-profit financier with limited but replenishable funds available for project investment. As each new wave of funds are made available, those applications best positioned to succeed criteria of both ambition and feasibility 
are able to secure new lines of low cost financing. So what are the implications then of this new federal Medicare governing approach, new stock building investments and the expansion of homelessness funds? You can see one, app, one implication, and the smiles right here, the NHS recently poured $1.3 billion into the Toronto community housing repairs in the form of both low interest loans and grants. Obviously, the city has been able to take advantage of NHS programming. But moving forward, what are some of the big picture takeaways that we should keep in mind from the shift? First, the NHS has opened up a new space for municipalities to pursue their own housing projects and needs, as in the case of the TCH investment. But, and maybe this is the most important qualifier of the whole NHS, cities have to compete for these funds. Almost all NHS programs welcome municipal applications, but these are assessed against similar proposals from other municipalities, not-for-profits, private developers, and even provinces. So cities like Toronto not only have to opt in to pursue these funds, but they have to do so on a competitive basis. Toronto has obviously had some success here, but there's also room to do more. Billions of dollars are available, but these won't be unlocked unless the city can make, realistically, several concurrent cases for not only how it can spend these funds, but how it can actually best spend these. Of course, the corollary implication here is that if cities like Toronto don't get these funds, there's probably no more money waiting in the wings. In other words, by establishing these programs on a competitive basis, it seems unlikely, if not impossible, that Ottawa is going to be willing to put up new funds for places like Toronto afterwards. The competition then really actually becomes survival of the fittest. The municipalities still working to engage housing policy intergovernmentally, or to borrow a political science phrase, diplomatically, will need to shift gears and make programmatic cases for their preferred projects. The second implication of this new competitive space is that there's simultaneously a new role for municipalities as partners. NHS programs specifically reward projects that receive greater amounts of their funding from other sources. And some, again, like the National Housing Co-Investment Fund, explicitly require some level of funding from other governments. As a result, ambitious municipalities actually have a remarkable new potential here to leverage their own investments in community partners to turn relatively small supports into big housing outcomes. Pictured below is one, I think, inter especially interesting example from Toronto again, of this partnering capacity in, pro in practice. Wigwaman Terrace, just across the street from the university, is an indigenous run seniors apartment complex that recently added 24 affordable units. Those would be in black in the drawing. The city committed $700,000 to the project, while the NHS added 1.4 million. So from the municipal perspective, I wanna stress that this is an example of the city being able to add valuable new affordable housing units for a relative bargain. I think that any developer and planner in the room here would gladly pay $30,000 a unit to get new accessible affordable housing in a heartbeat. And that's the sort of potential that can be unlocked here. A third, and I think maybe the most fascinating implication of the NHS is the somewhat quiet development of direct relationships between federal and municipal governments. Reaching home is obviously the longstanding example of this, one where the federal government has worked explicitly with municipal governments to transfer funds, deliver services, and shape policy. Direct federal municipal coordination, as, as I think we all know, has always been a third rail of Canadian federalism. And so it's actually quite significant to see this program not only surviving over the decades, but being significantly expanded in 2017 to little controversy. And this relationship has actually expanded even further recently. The 2020 Rapid Housing Initiative, added to the NHS as a result of the pandemic, directly funds municipalities for short duration projects aimed at alleviating homelessness, such as the pictured Margaret Mitchell Place in Vancouver. Unlike in Reaching Home, 
there isn't even an option here for municipalities to opt out and substitute local not-for-profits in their place. As far as I'm aware, this is actually the first time since the 2003 gas tax that the federal government has unilaterally directed municipal funds and policy goals. Ordinarily, I think this would have been enormously controversial, but clearly the emergency situation has recalculated everybody's jurisdictional calculus. And so the rapid housing initiative has gone uncontested and even expanded significantly in budget 2021. And now, obviously it's hard to put the genie back into the bottle, when it, especially when it comes to jurisdiction. So it'll be interesting to see what the effects of this direct partnership approach are moving forward into the future. It certainly seems likely that Ottawa will not want to give up being able to directly utilize local partners like this. So given these three implications, available new roles for municipalities as applicants, as partners, and as imposed federal partners, how should municipalities respond in turn? The answer, in a couple of words, is that municipalities of all kinds, but especially big cities like Toronto, have to step up and they have to lean in. The first part of this comes in being entrepreneurial. In other words, municipalities need to start thinking like developers. With billions of dollars on the table, whether it's developing new projects or rehabilitating existing assets, Toronto should be at the front of the line, making a business case for its projects. The long-standing model of weak trilateral coordination in housing, where cities identify a project and then lobby senior governments for one-time support, simply does not hold here. It's unlikely, again, to say the least, that the federal government will make housing funds available outside of the NHS. And so cities will have to figure out how to maximize their success within this new framework of competition. And abandon, if not abandon, deprioritize previous approaches to intergovernmental diplomacy. The good news for Toronto is that the NHS is designed, whether deliberately or not, with enormous advantages for municipal applicants. It seems that the federal government has an obvious interest in partnering with stable, accountable partners like municipalities, and cities can also use their planning and land use powers to maximize the potential feasibility, but also impact of their own applications. The only requirement here, really, is that they demonstrate the flexibility and the will to undertake this work proactively. The second recommendation then follows, but it calls for municipalities to be the leader in housing services in their own communities. While cities necessarily compete for funds in the NHS, there's significant room for partnership and for coordination. In the previous recommendation, I suggested that municipalities think like developers, but there's also just no getting around the fact that developers of all sorts bring unique skills, resources, and capacities to the table ones that municipalities just can't match. This, I want to stress, should actually be thought of as an advantage. With the constant potential for partnership, there's no reason why municipalities shouldn't be engaged in any and all app NHS applications coming from their own communities. Between municipal bureaucratic skills and capacities, their preferred treatment under several NHS programs, and their existing experience in simultaneously managing intergovernmental programs and local development, municipalities are actually ideally positioned here to steer the overall NHS approach in their own community. The federal government has developed this NHS approach by thinking like a meta governor, by using its own power to leverage and to correct the work of others. I suggest here municipalities can similarly use their legislative, bureaucratic, and financial resources to build the sorts of housing they need and want with the partners they feel are best. The recommendation, then, is that municipalities should also be thinking like meta-governors, meta-governors of their own communities, thinking beyond their own legislative or jurisdictional roles to instead claim and take a role as a democratic voice steering the development of their own communities. Whether they're building projects themselves or helping others to, their steering capacity overall is what's most important here. 
course, this is a big ask of anybody. How can somewhere like Toronto actually start doing this? I think that municipalities can visualize, but more importantly, institutionalize themselves as local housing policy nexuses that work simultaneously, both horizontally and vertically. Senior governments want certainty and accountability when they distribute funds, and local groups want a competitive edge when engaging senior governments. Municipalities like Toronto then have room to position themselves at this intersection between government and society as the place to go if you hold one piece of the housing puzzle and want or need help to finish the job. The City of Toronto already has extensive, effective housing agencies of all kinds and a well-regarded intergovernmental relations department. Extending and coordinating all of this expertise to reach out to civil society, coupled with ambitious project leadership from council, could promise to be a key piece of Toronto's affordable housing future. Municipalities are uniquely positioned to bridge the gap between community and government. And in the, and in, and in the, in the design of the NHS, this gap is exactly what the federal government has signaled that it wants to engage. Ottawa is eager to hand off decision-making to reliable partners. And so there's a vacuum here for ambitious municipalities to engage. However, you need to be able to do this quickly and consistently. And this requirement will require a dedicated place for housing optimization and investment coordination to occur. So what, is this, what does this all add up to? First, Canada does indeed have a national housing strategy, but the title is actually a bit misleading. The NHS works locally, and so it's at the local level that we need to think about engaging it. Secondly, the NHS isn't going to be a silver bullet here. Housing affordability in Canada is, frankly, more than a $40 billion problem. The path to solving it doesn't solely go through the strategy, but the strategy does reshape and redirect this path. Partnership and coordination are increasingly the order of the day in affordable housing policy. And so municipalities need to make themselves the best partners and the best coordinators that they can be. Third, the NHS is designed to help those who help themselves. There's multiple pathways to success here in using the strategy to get affordable and much needed housing built in local communities, but leadership of some sort of some form is required. If cities are unable or unwilling to serve as this sort of leader in their local housing policy communities, they should delegate a leadership role clearly and effectively, as some municipalities have done under the Reaching Home program. And finally, as I've tried to emphasize throughout the presentation, the NHS inc incidentally grants a great deal of informal power to municipalities. We talk a lot in city studies about the need for greater municipal powers, and rightfully so. But while trilateral agreements and even constitutional improvements may be a key long-term piece of this puzzle, municipalities can't afford to ignore what's on the table. Programs like the NHS offer what I'm referring to as soft or opt-in municipal powers. And these do tend to embed themselves over time, as in the case of reaching home, particularly as they see continued success. It falls on ambitious municipalities then to make the case through their own work in the area for new norms of municipal empowerment and according latitude in carrying out place-based policy. This, I'm suggesting, represents a major potential path forward for those municipalities willing and able to take it. That's everything in the presentation. Uh, thanks for everybody for listening and being here. Uh, and Enid, I'll hand it back over to you. Great, thank you. Um, I think maybe you need to stop sharing your screen. Great. Um, thank you very much. Well, that was quite a tour de force through uh, history and political science and a few other things, giving us uh, 
a good understanding of, of the national housing strategy. Um, I was going to encourage people to put questions in the Q&A, but we have lots of questions in the Q&A. Uh, so that is great. I will try and get to as many as we can. Let me start though. Um, you talked about a, a federal municipal and you put in brackets quiet relationship. Um, is this model something you think we're gonna see more of in housing policy going forward? And where are the province is going to fit in? Yeah, I, uh, you know, this is actually sort of one of the thoughts that this whole project was spurred out of. And I do think it's going to continue informing housing policy. And in fact, I think it's going to continue informing federal policy of all sorts for the future. That federal government, the federal government sort of looking at an increasingly complex world and complex set of problems is going to, rather than try to hammer out difficult, contentious trilateral agreements, or I should say, rather than only try to hammer these out, try to complement them with these sorts of direct opt-in level agreements that bring less contention. I think the open question here, of course, uh, is when the provinces may step in and put their foot down. It, it, I mean, there's a question from the audience that goes a little beyond this and says, is it possible that overall resources for affordable housing could decrease as provincial governments are bypassed as stakeholders under this strategy, thus being unwilling to contribute their own funds? Yeah, I mean, I, this, is, this is certainly something to think about that, especially because so many federal provincial funds are cost matched if fe the federal government is winding down it's provincial, provincial investments, presumably that is limiting some degree of cost matching in those programs. I think to answer this, we can really actually look at Quebec. I always joke to my students that Quebec is the one word answer to all Canadian politics questions uh, and see that Quebec has actually stepped in here and intervened in the original reaching home program design and in the rapid housing initiative rollout. So. The provinces evidently have the leverage, the capacity to step in and sort of take over, steer these programs when they see fit. So I think the implication of this is that they're certainly aware of these programs and are willing to sort of let these federal funds come in. Uh, and so I think my sense of it is that before they would cut funds, they would step in and try to steer or take a more active role in the existing funds that are coming in. And somebody just asked a question, is the NHS applied the same in Quebec as in the rest? You said Quebec, so is it applied <laughs> the same in Quebec as in the rest of Canada with direct CMHC contact with municipalities? So I actually, I'm not gonna lie, I don't have a great sense of this. Uh, obviously most of these documents are in French and my French is embarrassing. Uh, I do know that the reaching home programs are not applied the same that they work at a provincial level. Uh, and so I suspect that national housing strategy programs being obviously inspired by the reaching home approach follow have followed in the same model. They have to go through the province, uh, but I don't know that for certain. Okay. Um, I, I have another question and it's, it's uh, related to one of the ones from the audience as well. And, and that is, are there any intermunicipal equity concerns this approach might have. For example, smaller municipalities may not have as much expertise and capacity or only a, a limited number of civil society partners to collaborate with locally. So do they stand to benefit less from this shift than their larger urban counterparts? And again, one of the audience questions is, is very similar. Does the federal government privilege est existing established and larger players? Um, don't we need to engage in smaller players and the more local groups? Yeah, so I mean, first answer is that it's a complex program. Program. So there's a couple different ways that this can be answered. In homelessness, the federal government has always privileged. Sorry, my front door just blew open. Uh, the federal government has always privileged uh, cities based on their homelessness experiences. And so large cities have received a disproportionate or depending on how you define it, a proportionate share of homelessness funds. As far as the sort of expertise and ability to engage in these sort of nationally constituted funds, 
Uh, I think it's a good question and it's a real concern. And it's a concern that works not just between municipalities, but also within municipalities. Uh, and Nevena ha has talked about this, in this project some, uh, that there's a concern here that if you're turning major social policy areas over to individual groups and actors, some people are necessarily going to be left out. And so the federal government, by handing over this decision making, may be less able to look after or support uh, disadvantaged groups. So I think there is a challenge here. Uh, and I think that it's one that the National Housing Strategy has offered some resources to ameliorate, uh, but it's one that we certainly need to think about as the program rolls out. Okay. Another question which is really saying, is this really a new departure? Uh, the question goes, the nonprofit programs of 1975 to 1993, as well as AHI and IAH from 2001 to 2016, all federally designed and largely provincially administered involved competitive selection of local sponsor partner groups, large mandatory non-federal co-funding, and significant Toronto land and soft cost contributions. So again, the question is, why should we see NHS, the NHCF as a brilliant new departure? Yeah, I mean, I certainly, uh, you know, I, I don't wanna sound like a cheerleader for the program here or, uh, or somebody negative towards it. I think the, the, one of the major shifts here is away from ongoing program funding and towards capital funding. So long-term operating agreements have been wound down as part of this, both directly federally administered ones and ones administered through the provinces. And the shift has gone to a project by project basis. So I think we can really characterize this shift away from a federal attempt to, to steer the overall picture to selecting and empowering groups to steer their own individual pictures. And I, I think that represents a somewhat major shift in how the federal government actually sees its own role in social policy, not directing, but enabling and steering the work of others. So this is your meta, meta being a meta governor is that what you yes mean? yeah <laughs> okay um somebody asks a, a question i wonder if this renewed federal investment is a tacit acknowledgement that it was a mistake to withdraw from social housing back in the 1990s uh you know all i can say about that uh, is that i live in toronto and i think any programs to bring down housing prices for the last 25 years would have been greatly appreciated. Okay, um, you talked about the Rapid Housing Initiative and this questioner says it has a 12 month timeline on delivering the units, which usually forces municipalities to accelerate their own planning and rezoning processes, often by requesting a minister's zoning order from the province. Uh, what other ways can the NHS be used to accelerate the delivery of new affordable housing. Yeah, I think, you know, I think this kind of gets at the heart of the meta governance piece here is that the federal government is able to sort of flexibly and tactically figure out how to design and engage programs to shorten timelines. So the rapid housing initiative, you know, I think in an older model may have reached out to the provinces first and tried to negotiate some MZOs. Uh, and then this negotiation process would take a while and so on. So by engaging local partners and then having them sort of do the bureaucratic work, I think is one of the ways that it sort of speeds up the process. And as far as speeding up other processes, uh, I think that the this is why I really wanna emphasize the new municipal or the available municipal role here is that by securing funding, there's significant potential for municipalities to shift their efforts to shepherding projects and moving them along, rather than looking for, looking for money and looking for partners. Okay. We have lots of questions. I hope you're okay to continue. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Often we look for questions, but uh, you know, whenever we do something on housing, we get a lot of interest at IMFG, a lot of participants and a lot of questions. So if you don't mind, we'll keep going. Um, Absolutely. Uh, you talked a bit about funding. So depending on how the funds are raised by smaller municipalities to finance projects, 
Do you have a view on the fiscal risk entailed for those with lesser fiscal capacity? Yeah. Uh, we're going back to the large versus small again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think this is such an interesting piece of it. One of the clear goals of the NHS is to reduce fiscal risk by lowering the costs of mortgages and loans and by delivering some of these things in the form of grants. So it is in many ways explicitly a risk reducing enterprise. And this is sort of what I want to touch on when I talk about using local resources, is that the federal government has funds, but almost as importantly, it has stability. And so the goal here is to lower, one of the goals rather, is to lower the risk of housing starts. As far as how that can, how we can help smaller municipalities in that process, uh, I think that one of the answers here is that there's some room to make the case in each application criteria for local conditions and sort of your local experience, your local need. And so there's room in the existing program, and I think there's room to expand on this to make some case for specification of small, small needs, small scale needs. Some of this is already taking place. You know, some programs will do as little as a, as a five unit investment. Some will do five total units across multiple buildings. Uh, but I think one, maybe one necessary corollary here is in the same way that the Reaching Home program offers bureaucratic support to local community entities, could offer bureaucratic and application support to local builders and partners to, to manage their own applications. Um, here's a two-part question. Um, Municipalities do not have an incentive to build affordable housing as it will reduce their property tax base. Uh, residents support affordable housing, but not in my backyard. <laughs> what should be the response of the federal and municipal governments? Or is there something in the national housing strategy that deals with this? Yeah, I mean, this is, I think, one of the most interesting parts of the national housing strategy is that because it's a federal document, it's Frankly, these are not the federal government's problems. Uh, and it, it knows, I think, on a basic level, that if it makes these funds available, somebody will take them. So the question, I think, becomes, you know, what can municipalities or maybe even what can provinces do to make up for these tax issues and these local development issues? Uh, and I think in both cases, this is a problem that falls on municipal councils and that, you know, there's no... It seems that there's no silver bullet for nimbyism in cities. Uh, oh, here, I thought you were going to answer this for yeah. us and tell us what <laughs> municipal, you got as far as municipal councils. I thought you were then going to say what they should be doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I mean, the uh, perhaps one of the, you know, the the only real administrative criteria here I think we can imagine is a federal requirement that these projects not be amended in municipal review. That's the, that's the only sort of power the federal government has here. And I think it's the only realistic power given the sort of ward level concerns of councillors and municipal government. Okay. Um, so many questions, I don't, I don't know where to go. Uh, someone would welcome your thoughts on the sunset clauses in the national housing strategy. For example, the requirements of only 10 to 20 years of affordability depending on the stream. Does this support the kind of housing we need and want? Yeah, I. so I think this is, to me, when I was just researching the national housing strategy, this is one thing that really struck me. It wasn't really emphasized in the presentation, is the sort of immediate role of the NHS in getting projects going, and then the quickly receding role. And so I think, you know, there is room here for longer term engagement. Obviously, especially in co-op housing, the federal government's role you know, used to be a lifetime one. And it seems that one real interest of the national housing strategy is severing these lifetime relationships and not developing new ones. And so, you know, I think one from where I'm sitting, one sort of quick win for the federal government, even if it sort of doubles back on the approach of the national housing strategy, 
is to offer some room for ongoing financial support for the projects that it wants to develop. Okay. Um, one of the major changes to the federal rule in housing that came with the NHS is an overall decrease in federal grants for social housing. You mentioned this. Uh, this uh, questioner says by 30% according to the parliamentary budget officer and a significant increase in loans for developers. So this is reiterating what you said. The shift marks a major reallocation of federal funds away from social housing and towards privately produced rental housing, which is mostly market rate. Do you see this as concerning? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a question that has to be answered in two directions. And I realize that's probably a little disappointing. On the one hand, Toronto and the rest of the country is desperately in need of new market rental housing. I think the figure right now is that 80% of Toronto's rental stock is at least 30 years old. You know, this can't hold and somebody needs to get new market rental buildings built. And so I think one thing the federal government has done here is sort of, again, through this program design, picked and chosen its role based on what it wants to be seen doing. And, you know, perhaps it's maybe just more politically advantageous to help renters than it is to help affordable housing users. And so, yes, there's absolutely more here that needs to be done by everybody for affordable and for social housing. Uh, and one fortunate piece of this, I think, is again, that the toolkit approach of the national housing strategy makes it somewhat easy to bolt on new approaches or to nudge eligibility criteria. So I think, sum up basically, an investment in market rentals is sorely needed, but it absolutely can't be accompanied by a cut in social housing. Here's an easy one. Can you share this presentation with us? I'll answer that. <laughs> yes, indeed. The presentation will be on our website and, and, and uh, so will this presentation. Um, but the next part of the question is, what is, and, and again, it's a similar question that other people have been asking, what is the financial impact placed on the municipality given their increased role in housing? Yeah, so the way the NHS sort of pictures this or wants to present it is that it's simply supplementing existing efforts. So the sort of interpretation through the NHS is that the municipal role is actually the municipal fiscal burden, I should say, is actually reduced. One thing I emphasize in the presentation, of course, is that this is an opportunity to increase the municipal fiscal role by taking on new projects. So this is where it comes down to what sort of municipal government its leaders want to have. And this is where I think for the case of Toronto, Toronto Council has for a long time being obviously the owner of its social housing system and being a firm advocate for increased municipal investment where it can, that this does have some concerning implications for the long-term carrying costs of housing in the city. Uh, how I feel about it, I think, is that it's good to just never leave money on the table and that Toronto is better off taking these investments now, getting what it can out of them, and then when it needs new funds, indicate indicating a demand for those rather than trying to sort of get those funds at the same time and if it can't nixing projects altogether okay uh toronto's clearly embracing opportunities under the nhs do you see other neighboring cities engaging in nhs programs like mississauga hamilton or oshawa for example have you looked at other cities or are you mostly focusing on toronto so I've mostly focused on Toronto. Uh, I have a sort of personal interest in Hamilton as my hometown. Uh, and Hamilton is actually doing some really cool stuff here. Um, basically just reinvesting in its own sort of, to be honest, dilapidated social housing stocks. Uh, so when you comb through the investment list of the national housing strategy, one thing you're, one thing you're struck by actually is just how many different places are using these funds and at how many different scales. You know, the TCH program came in at $1.3 billion, but there's five figure investments going on here in small communities. And so it seems, and I'm not sure if this is through sort of a deliberate federal effort or just 
the scale of applications, but there's take up here everywhere and impact everywhere. Okay, I'm going to ask you one more question. There are more, believe me, but I'll, we'll finish with this last one. To what extent can the NHS be used to create not just additional housing, but also stimulate the development of more complete communities in the areas where they are located, or are the funds restricted strictly to housing? Yeah. One thing I, if there's one takeaway, I really kind of hope that everybody can take away from this is that this is money that can be used to complement just about anything. And if municipalities are sort of active, local, so use the term again, meta governors in their own communities, you know, these funds can at the very least be part of building cohesive, complete communities and can free up local funds for the other pieces of it that they need. So from the federal perspective, you know, the, inter the interest here is not in building cohesive, complete communities. I mean, it's certainly not against the idea, uh, but it's, it's not what the funds are targeted for. But there is enormous p potential to use these funds as part of an overall vision or an overall project. Great. Well, I promised that would be the last question. I'm afraid <laughs> I've left some questions on the table and I apologize to the questioners, uh, but we will pass all of these questions on to James. Uh, to take a look at. So it's just uh, left for me to say thank you so much, James. Uh, great presentation, really interesting. Housing, of course, is of interest to everybody. And uh, you were great at answering questions. So, so thank you for, for doing that. Uh, just to say again that today's event uh, has been recorded and will be available on our website in the weeks to come. Uh, please share it with your colleagues who couldn't attend today. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. And thank you for all of your questions. Have a good evening. <laughs>